This court is now resumed. You may be seated. Thank you. Are you ready? Yes. Um, good afternoon. Is Professor Kersner? Afternoon. Yeah, it, it's Professor Kersner, correct? That's fine. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, Professor Kersner, I've handed up to my friends and to the court a little booklet entitled uh, Eric Kersner Cross Examination Compendium. Okay. And I hope someone gave you a copy. I have a copy right here. And I may be referring to some of the things in, in this document. And I wonder for purposes of identification, if we could mark it as a, a no, no, just for identification, exhibit M, is it? Yes. All right. So if we could mark that this document, Eric Kersner Cross Examination Compendium Exhibit M, I might have some questions for you. And and if I'm not speaking loudly enough, and if you need so me, so far I can hear you fine. Thanks. Okay. I tend to talk pretty loud, so that's good for me. Okay. So okay. Uh, First uh, question, I, I just have a couple of questions for you that maybe you can help me in the court out. The first one is I want to stay with your slide deck 76. If you can open up page 76 of your slide deck, which is towards the very end. And I'll wait for you to get there and then I'll ask you a question. You there? Yes. Now, Professor Kirzner, the judge asked you a question about, and, and this deals with the uh, time period about investing. Um, and uh, you answered that it was in the, you said 1945 to 1950. Then you, I think you also said 1950 and you talked about Sir John Templeton, but you phrased your answer in respect of individuals investing. Yes, I did. Yes. Yes. Right. Now you're aware of um, things like the Harvard Endowment Fund. I am. And while individuals could only access the capital markets through mutual funds in the 1950s, endowment funds and other uh, funds did so much earlier. Sorry, I didn't. I hear the last part of your question. Oh, I'll. The Harvard Endowment Fund didn't only start investing in the stock market in the 1950s, did they? I don't believe so, no. Right. And so the point is, is that for organizations or for endowment funds, these endowment funds were investing in capital markets long before the 1950s. There were institutional investors that were active before the 1950s, yes. They were active before the turn of the century in the 1880s. There were some. There were some. How about 1850? Did you do any research on that? We're getting back to maybe this is a historian's work. No, maybe I you know. I can't answer whether there were large uh, endowment funds in the 1850s. No. You, you don't know. No. But you do know there were some in the 1880s. I do know. It, it, can you help the court with a date when large institutional investors would have been in the market or you just say sometime before 1880 is that fair now the market was still pretty well individually i i can't give an exact date though i don't i don't want to i mean i'd have to research that right yeah. okay so the best you've got is 1880 sometime somewhere around there okay I wonder, sir, um, in your main report, um, I have a couple questions about that. 
uh, it's exhibit 38. Um, at times you reference a fellow by the name of Carl Beale. Do you remember oh. that? Sure, he, he was the, he was the, he was an expert. I know, I know who Carl Beale is, yes. Right, now, now it, it, this report is noted as edited on November 25, 2022. And one of the reasons I understand it was edited was to take out references to Dr. Carl Beale, who's not testifying. Pardon? My friend can help me if you if, if she wants. Yeah, in fact, there were two changes made. It was uh, revised in November to add production numbers to make it easier. The footnotes we added the Canadian uh, production numbers to correspond to those paper eight, and then it was redacted in December. Oh, okay. Thank you. So it was redacted in December to take out reference to Carl Beal. That's my understanding. I had now I've read through the report, and at times Carl Beal's name is still in there. Should we be telling the judge that where you left references to Carl Beal in, it's not relevant to your report, or do we have to go through each um, section? Mr. Schachter, I think I'm going to have to um, be careful with this. I had nothing to do with the redacted report. That, that's not within my... I can't decide how a report should be redacted. That's for the lawyers to do. So you didn't do the redactions at all? No, uh, that wouldn't be something I would do. Do you know who did do the redactions? Um, I would assume the lawyers did that. I, I but, can't redact a report. Okay, but 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 you don't know who did? Let me explain. I would have no reason to redact a report. I wouldn't know uh, under what circumstances a report should be redacted. And I don't have that type of training. Okay. So... When you say this is your report, Exhibit 38, it's your report, save for the decisions made about the redactions over which you don't take ownership. Is that fair? Well, um, there's been portions that have been redacted that I assume dealt with um, with uh, Professor Beale, who I understand is not well or something along those lines. but. Yeah, my whatever, only point but, is you don't. As I'm saying, for whatever reason, portions of this report were redacted. Yes, but portions of it still mention Dr. Carl Beale, and I'm wondering if there's a reason for that. Um, that is not something I could answer because I I didn't do the redactions. Okay. Aside from the redactions, then. Um, is it fair for me to say that both you and Professor Booth are joint authors of this report? Yes. I wonder, sir, if you could turn to your curriculum vitae. I have a couple questions for you. And your curriculum vitae is in your report starting at page 70. Is it under one of the tabs? Yeah. Um, it's just, I don't have tabs in mind. Okay. I've got I it. just have page 70 in the top right-hand corner. I believe it's under mine. It's tab B, but I'm not sure. Oh. Okay, so I'm making a note that it's tab B. And at page 70, that's where that's your CV? Oh, yes, it is. Yes. All right. Now, if you go over to um, page 77, there's a heading entitled Papers in Referee Journals. Right. And if you go over on page 78, it says papered in refereed conference proceedings. Right. What's a refereed article? A refereed journal is a journal in which um, um, someone has reviewed it and decided it was worthy of uh, publication. 
So it goes through a peer review process. That's correct. Now, um, I note that you your peer reviewed articles are all in the eight, 1980s and 1990s, save for two pages which were written in 2001 about hedge funds and two pages written in 2002 on hedge funds. Do you want me to take you to that or do you agree with that? Oh, I, I agree with that. I know that, yes. And when I said two pages, it looks like it was probably two pages in a journal and two pages. Um, In in it, sorry, two pages in in journals. Excuse me, is that right? Yes, two pages in a paper about hedge funds in two thousand one, and two pages in a hedge about a hedge fund in two thousand two. Under referee journals, that's right. Now, the approach that you have put forward in your report for this case involves using spending patterns of Indian bands to figure out the lost opportunity cost for the bands. Is that right? To eventually to eventually come up with an estimate of the bring forward value, yes. But the approach that you're using, it has not been the subject of a peer reviewed article that you've written? No, no. The approach, can I call it the, should I call it the Kersner Booth approach? Because most people seem to call it the Booth Kersner approach. <laughs> whatever, whatever you like, Mr. Shacker. I don't mind going. You don't that. mind calling it the Booth Kersner report like because I think I'll probably slip into that. Okay. Okay. So can we call it the Booth Kersner approach? Yes. Am I correct that the Booth Kersner approach was developed for the government of Canada at Canada's request? Um, Canada requested that they didn't direct how our approach should be used. Canada directed us to come up with our method for determining what the bring forward value should be based on a set of NCRRs. But they didn't direct us. They didn't direct what the Booth Kersner approach should be. Oh, um, maybe I'm I misunderstood not, your question. I, I, I'm. I think perhaps my question wasn't clear. So my apologies. At some point in time, what is has been described as the Booth Kersner approach uh, was used in a number of court cases in the past. Correct. That would be true. It was not the subject of an academic article that you wrote before it, it came into existence. Is that true? That's true. It came into existence while you were working on one or some case or for the government of Canada. Is that true? Yes, we developed a model and approach that we thought was appropriate. I, I I I don't want to challenge you on whether you thought it was appropriate. I'm sure you did, but I'm just trying to fix it temporally. And when was that? Um, if you can remember. No, I do remember. My um, my first meeting on the subject was in 2008, and um, we had meetings with I, I'm, I'm rethinking this just to get to get it in the right time frame um, we had meetings with um, Joan Holmes to talk about the trust accounts that's when I learned about the trust accounts and how they can be used and um, we would have started using this approach somewhere I would think around 2010 or 2011 maybe 2009 who's we started using Lawrence this approach Okay. And so you met with Joan Holmes? Yes. Did you meet with anyone from the government? Yes. And who did you meet with? Well, in 2008, I, re I, I was sitting in a room with a number of um, lawyers from the Department of Justice. Um, uh, we're describing, we described the um, 
the all though the the whitefish decision and um they um, asked me what my reaction to the way i don't think i can go too deep into this because there's probably some privilege but they asked me about my reaction to the whitefish decision um Were there any, uh, aside from the Department of Justice, were there other government officials present, like uh, people who work at specific claims? Absolutely not. It was it was strictly um, strictly uh, uh, lawyers. Thank you. And is it also? Um, I don't know. I, I guess I I would put it this way. In your approach, uh, I noticed that. Um, you allow for compound interest throughout historic periods, correct? Right. And uh, do you think that's appropriate? Do I think that compounding should be used? Yeah. Never mind the, the rate. That's a big issue, but just the compounding issue. Yes, I can't. I, yes, my, my approach is compounding when it's, when the, yes. Thank you. Was your question, Mr. Schachter, um, you, you notice that compound interest was was allowed or used in no, a and, historic period? Sorry, the, the, so maybe I can try and rephrase the question a bit. Okay. You, um, you're an economist. Right. One of the jobs that you uh, know about is how to um, uh, figure out someone's lost opportunity over time. Yes. And when you do that from an economics point of view, from an economist's point of view, excuse me, compound interest is appropriate. Yes. Thank you. Now, at page third oh um looking at your cv for a moment um i didn't see and and perhaps you can agree with me with this you have no specific expertise uh in anishinaabe culture do you no i do not um you have no specific experience experience in understanding the concept of bamadzuin do you the concept of Bamadzuin. Have you ever heard of that before? No. Okay. Sorry. Well, I guess the answer is that no. you don't. <laughs> answer is no. Okay. And I take it, sir, that you don't have any specific experience in Anishinaabe economic history. I do not. Okay. At page 30 of your report, Under the heading, the booth Kersner compensation model, you say, we understand that the goal of compensation is to restore what the plaintiffs lost due to the breach. Right. And are, do you understand that the breach is the failure to pay the annuity augmentation in a timely fashion when it was due? Yes. At paragraph 81, you write in particular that the goal is, and now in quotation marks, restoring the plaintiff's lost opportunity to save, consume, and invest. This is a paragraph 81 in the second line. Right. This is what you say. That's what we said, yes. Right. And I think it's implicit within paragraph 81, but I want to be explicit today. Compensation would not only restore the plaintiff's lost opportunity to save, consume, and invest, in your words, 
but you would agree with me it would also include in the actual annuity payment that should have been paid? I think they're the same thing, if I understand your question. Well, the way I look at it, I look at it is first you get an annuity payment. I would consider that to be in investment terms of the capital. Would you agree? Right. And then in your terms, this is you have a lost opportunity to save, consume, and invest. Those are two separate things in my mind. And I'm I'm thinking well, maybe it, you don't think the they're the same. is what generates the ability to um to uh, save, consume, and invest. So if you if for example you receive the annuity payment and you didn't do anything with it, you just put it in 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 a bank or the bank trust account. It would accumulate for 169 years, and that's what you'd have. If you spend some of it, you'd be spending some of the capital. The capital's the tree. You'd be spending some of the the fruit from the tree, and you would have what um, that would generate for the future. You can't you can't have both. Sorry, the only point I'm trying to make is the way I read paragraph 81. It was suggesting to me that the goal of compensation is only about lost opportunity. You say save, consume, invest. I'm going to say use. Um, the only goal of compensation is to restore the plaintiff's lost opportunity to use the annuity monies. That's one component of it. The other component I suggest is to actually get the annuity monies. But as, as, if I understand your question, sir, when they receive the annuity, they can do one of two things with it. They can save it or they can invest it. So yes, they could still be holding the annuity today, the capital, if it, but, mm -hmm. but, but wouldn't have generated anything if they just left it there. But the compensation that the judge is being asked, on a, I'll, I'll be as direct as I can, we are asking the judge to award compensation that includes two major elements. One is compensation for the lost opportunity to ha of having gotten the annuity in the past. And so let's suppose the augmented annuity should have been $10 in 1858. Right. So we lost the opportunity to get the $10. That's one element of the loss. The second element is we lost the opportunity to use that $10 until the, and, until the judge makes a decision and the award is paid. Do you see, understand the two differences? I understand the difference, but um, it may be outside my, my framework um, uh, in terms of how the, <clears throat> of how this is, um, of how this is proceeding. $10 Underpayment is what you're asking me about. I, I'm asking you if the if, if the compensation would include in the underpayment. Yes. Yeah, so so a ten dollar say I, which using your example a ten dollar underpayment. Would, but would you agree that part of the compensation, part of the goal of compensation is to restore to the plaintiffs the underpayment? The goal, the goal of compensation is to restore the band to the position it would have been in if it had received the underpayment. Right, but first it has to receive the underpayment it didn't get, right? No, but yes, but the goal of compensation is to restore the band the position it would have been in if it received the underpayment. Which means, and I, which means that either, it's any number of possibilities, they could have taken the underpayment and spent it. They could have taken the underpayment and invested it. They could have taken the underpayment and stuck it in the bank for the next 169 years. Um, but if so, you, that's what they would get. Okay. I, I guess maybe I can try and square the circle this way. You would agree with me that if there was an underpayment of $10, never mind what they did with it, what might have done with it, the judge should award them $10. They were underpaid by ten dollars. They should get ten dollars brought forward to the present. Thank you.
Now, you, in paragraph 81, you use the words save, consume, and invest. And in your answer to me, you use the words save or invest. Okay. Um, am I correct that saving and investing are the same thing? Um, yes, but we use them. We, we did it. We distinguished saving where, where money is left in the band trust account and investing where um, the band uh, invests in um, real assets or in financial assets. Now, we didn't use financial assets, but um, um, they could uh, invest in real assets. So, so you receive a dollar. You can save it by by keeping it in the in the capital in the revenue account and earning um, band trust account rate. You can consume it, or you can invest it. Okay. Uh, is it fair to say that different experts have different assumptions about what rates of return um, might be and could be reasonable for um, saving, consumption, and investing? Absolutely, yes. There's not one absolute correct answer for the judge to take from uh, any of the evidence she hears, is there? Um, well, I, I don't think I can speak for the judge, but um, there certainly are different approaches to calculating and estimating rates of returns and how <clears throat> an underpaid amount should have been consumed, spent, or saved. Yes. Right. So it's not scientific. It's a matter of opinion. Um, I don't. I don't know if I would go so far as to say it's not scientific. I think it can be based on, um, to be based on good economic principles, but it's also a matter of opinion. Yes. Right. Uh, among economists, you can have different reasonable opinions. Economists will have different opinions. Absolutely. And they can have difference of opinions on rates of return. Absolutely. And if memory serves me correct, one in this case, there is differences of opinion about rates of return. Yes, and I and I really hope that I emphasize that today in my uh, in my in my testimony. Okay. Now I wonder if we could, for a moment, turn to Exhibit M, the compendium, and in the compendium, I've got a number of documents I want to take you through, and. Sure. You were kind enough to note in your CV that you had testified in a couple of other court cases. Well, in, in quite a few, yes. Yes, and I, I I just read a couple of them, and I have a question or two for you for some of them. And the first one was in C Court and Global Securities. Oh, yeah, C -Court. Yeah, it's C -Court. a 2000 British Columbia Supreme Court case. It's at tab one of Exhibit M. And I've only included in an excerpt of it that dealt with how the court dealt with your testimony. Yeah. And if you go over to page 79 and, and 89, sorry, page four at the bottom, um, at the bottom right-hand page, you've got the page numbers for the compendium page numbers. Bottom right-hand corner. Oh, yes, yes. All of those numbers are page numbers to the compendium itself. And um, the judge in that case, um, at paragraph 79 in the middle of page four of the compendium, um, talks about your area of expertise. You see that? I do. And then at paragraph 89, it says, the cross-examination of Professor Kersner revealed that in some respects, this witness had overstated the facts and his opinion arising from them and had made some errors in his calculations. And he, at the bottom of this paragraph, he says, um, there was a tendency to advocacy that was revealed. You see that? I do. I remember that. You remember, and it was overstatements and errors in your calculations that made this judge concerned about um, you being an advocate. I do recall that, and I read uh, I read that decision very carefully. I don't believe I've ever been accused of that 
since. Uh, um, okay. I've, I've always been careful. I might have used too many adjectives in that one. I do recall that judge still used my uh, evidence in uh, in coming to uh, coming to a decision. I do recall that. Um, but you know, this is one of many times that I've testified. Okay. So uh, we're going to hold on to that thought about overstatements um, and re perhaps reaching too far in overstatements for another time. But I wonder if we could go to the next case and tab two. Vipond. At tab two, we have the case of Vipond and... Um, AGF Private Investments Management, a 2012 case of the Ontario Super, uh, Superior Court. Do you remember that case? I do. Now, what I thought it was interesting about this case is uh, paragraph 139. You were, you were qualified as an expert. And at paragraph 139, it says, Professor Kirzner provided opinion evidence on whether AGF suitably managed Mr. Vipon's account, and more specifically, whether the investments and the structure of Mr. Vipon's account were suitable in light of the circumstances, objectives, and risk tolerances in described in Mr. Vipon's account opening forms. See that? I do. And you have a fair bit of experience in appropriate investment structures. Is that true? Yes. Um, um, I appreciate in this case, the judge may not have uh, um, uh, accepted your calculations, but that's not the point of, that I want to emphasize right now. Um, so when you want to examine what kind of investments someone should have, you have to look at their objectives, their risk toler and their risk tolerances, right? Objectives, risk tolerances, investment horizon, um, financial circumstances, um, uh, those are oh, investment knowledge, investment experience are all, all <laughs> key factors in determining what is suitable for the client. Right. Now, if you go over to, excuse me, a moment. Can we go to your instructions, sir? I just want to turn to your instructions, which you will find in your report. And I, I, I'll, I, I bet you it's a tab, but I don't have it as a tab. I've got it as, at um, page 47. Yes. All right. At page 47, we have your append. Oh, it says Appendix A at the top, but I don't have a tab. What? Um, it's dated July 11th, 2022. Yes. Yes. And um, if you go over on page 48 of, of the report, you were told to assume that the First Nations could decide for themselves how the ban could distribute monies from the annuity augmentation paid by the Crown to the Anishinaabe, is that right? Okay, if you just direct me to the paragraph. Yes, it, 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 um, it, it, about the middle of the page, there's a paragraph starting, of course. Oh, yes, uh, 
Of course, regardless how the Crown might exercise its discretion in consultation with the First Nations to determine what portion of the collective annuity should be distributed by the Crown to individuals, the First Nations themselves may make their own determinations as to if and how they distribute amounts from the collective annuity to individual band members. Right. In exercising this discretion, the First Nations might have regard to their own systems of law and governance. See that? I do. Now, right after that statement, there's a reference to experts reports of Dr. Stark, Dr. Bohawker, and Dr. Dribben that may provide useful information in this regard. Right. Now, um, Dr. Stark and Dr. Bohawker are not testifying, and their reports are not before the court, but Dr. Dribben's is. And can you tell me, did you take into account what Dr. Stark, Bohawker, or Dribben wrote in forming your opinion? Um, I don't believe that I'm sure that the reports were just fine, but they would not have been relevant to what I was doing. If you turn over to page 51, there is a number of assumptions, um, very specific assumptions that start on page 50. And it says, for the purpose of preparing your opinion and calculations, please consider the following facts and make the following assumptions. And assumption number six uh, says, the historic losses in the Rastoul and White Sand cases are based on annuity increases required under the treaties that went unpaid. Annuities do not qualify as Indian monies. See that there? I do. You so, were sorry, I don't. Okay. Where are we? Page pa 50? Uh, page 51. Oh, 50. Sorry. 51, item number six. Got it. The first okay. three lines. Um, you were told that to, you should assume that annuities do not qualify as Indian monies as defined under the Indian Act. You see that? Yes, but okay, come on. Sorry. At paragraph 23 of your report. I'm sorry, I, I just. Um, yeah, go ahead. Nevertheless, in preparing your opinion in this case, do not make assumptions about legislative restrictions under the Indian Act with respect to the management of Indian monies. I, I think those are connected. How? Oh. I think. How are they connected? It's important to connect those. Yeah, what, 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 how Sorry, would you think they're interrupt. important to connect? Sorry, I didn't get either. So uh, I'll try and paraphrase it for the reporter. You have just told the court and me that there's a, another clause in paragraph six that you think it's important for context. Is that fair? Yes. And you want to refer to the portion of the paragraph about not making assumptions about legislative restrictions, right. correct? Right. And my question is, how is that important to whether or not it's Indian monies or not? I'm, I'm giving you the opportunity to explain why the two are connected. Okay, I, I, I'm, I'm now lost. Could you, you repeat your initial question just so I can? Well, my, my, you answered my original question, which was about you were told to assume it wasn't Indian monies. And I take it from your response, sir, that you thought I was being perhaps unfair to you and that there was some uh, other verbiage in paragraph six that uh, contextualizes the answer about uh, being asked to assume it's not Indian monies. Yes, including the final sentence, but... Um... I don't want to be unfair to you. No, no, I understand and I don't want to be unfair to you. Um... Um, we assume that um, distributions made to individuals were paid out of the um, out of the revenue accounts, and that was the 
um, important aspect of the application of our model. I'm not sure where where this first issue comes in. That's all. You're not sure whether where the issue issue of the annuities not being Indian monies comes in. Is that what you mean? Um, let, let me read this again. Okay, sure. I read take take thing. take your time. Yeah. Okay. It, it, would, you, would you like to provide an answer? No, I, need or... to hear, I need to hear your question again. Well, my question was, you were told not to assume that annuities are not Indian monies. I believe we were not told that. You were not told that. So you're in, you did, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm a little bit confused. Paragraph six says to assume that annuities do not qualify as Indian monies. And you're saying you did not, you were not told to assume that? It's a double negative, so we have yeah, to be careful yeah, here. Um, what I did, I, I'll tell you what I did. I assumed that the annuities were paid into the um, into the revenue account, and some of them were distributed to individuals. And that's, okay. that's what that's that's my answer to this. Okay, why did you assume that they were paid into the revenue account? That's been my experience with um, with underpayments that they were paid actually into the capital account, then into the revenue account, and then distributed to individuals. And that's that's the way I believe it happened. Um, when you say that's the way you believed it happened, I don't think the payments have been made yet. So there's no historical record as to where the annuity augmentations there were went. Any payments made. You're talking about the augment the Yeah, I'm talking the about unpaid, the, the, the unpaid. Yeah, the unpaid amounts. They've never been paid. No, I understand. But the, but there were annuities paid. Yes. Right? And it's your understanding that the annuities to the Robinson Superior Treaty annuitants was paid into the band's revenue account? I don't I do, do not believe it went directly in all cases to individuals. But it won't affect the way I approached it. Perhaps we can turn to paragraph 23 of your report. At paragraph 23 of your report, you make reference to a, a one particular aspect of the Court of Appeal judgment. Sorry, I'm, I'm, is it page 20? It's page eight of your report, paragraph 23, under overview. Have you found it? I, I have. All right. And in the middle of it, set off in the middle of, in the page at paragraph 23 is an excerpt of paragraph 1E from the judgment. Do you see that? Are we in paragraph 23? We're in paragraph 23, and there are words set off in the middle of the page that says, the crown shall, comma, in a manner consistent with the honor of the crown, comma, consult with the First Nation treaty parties to determine what portion, comma, if any, comma, of the increased annuity amount is to be distributed by the crown to the individual treaty rights holders in addition to the $4 per person per year they are already being paid, semicolon. You see that there? I do. You then say at paragraph four, and notwithstanding 
your the instructions, you say, we interpret this passage as asking us to deal with both the augmentation of the annuities through payments beyond the current four dollars. That would be to individuals, correct? Yes. As well as the deposit of funds owed as annuities into the band trust accounts. See that there? Yes. What am I correct in understanding that you proceeded with your report on the understanding that all annuity funds would initially go into the band's revenue and then the trust accounts? Actually, but, it's, it's, it's not relevant to my model because we didn't deal with the flows. We, 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 we dealt with, um, with the spending patterns of the band. Well, so go back to page 52 of your report, which is part of your instructions. And it says, assume, and this is the top of page 52, you were asked to assume reasonable investment scenarios based on relevant factors other than legislative restrictions or policies under the Indian Act. See that? Yes. yes. You did not, in your report, consider an investment scenario whereby the band, of the individuals, the band would receive an uh, annuity augmentation monies and would not put it into the band trust account, correct? One more time, sorry. Mr. I'll put it in the positive. Yeah. The only investment. Sorry, I want to get the cor correct wording here. Excuse me. The only investment scenario you took into account was where the annuity augmentation monies went into the band's trust account. The annuity augmentation payments would go into the bands. That 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 that's where the model worked. Would go into the trust account and then be um, distributed to individuals. But would you agree with me? It didn't have to go into the band's trust account. If it didn't. It, it wouldn't make any difference in the model. Well, it wouldn't make any difference for the model, but it might make a difference for the person holding the money to invest it. key point is <clears throat> where does the where does the dollar end up and how is it spent that we do, I mean, we fully deal with that oh, let me you, you, you're an expert let me put a hypothetical to you before we break for the day um if you have a group say an indian band in 1987 that gets 10 dollars by way of now, let's be more realistic. Let's suppose it's $50,000 by way of an augmented annuity. Now, there's nothing that says in your instructions that you would have to assume that that money went into the band trust accounts. You agree with that? No, in your hypothetical 1987, $50,000 augmented annuity could have gone directly to... Um, to individual band members, it could have gone into the uh, into the account, depending on the. the well, I'm asking you to assume that it that it was a payment to the band, not to individuals. Okay, if it was paid to the band, to, sorry, to the individuals. Is that no, I'm saying? asking you to assume that it was paid to the band collective. Okay, it was okay. paid to the band collective. Yes. Okay, I'll use let's say I'll use one of my clients, the Red Rock First Nation. Fine. So Red Rock First Nation gets a check of fifty thousand dollars. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I have no idea which crown it would come from, but we, there's a payment made to them of $50,000 in this hypothetical. Yes. In this hypothetical, where they get $50,000, there's nothing in your instructions that says they had to put it in the band trust account, is my point. No, that's right. 
but you assumed it would go into the band trust account. Why? I didn't have to assume that because I, I'm not using the flows. I'm using fifty thousand um, dollars received in in 1987. Um, what would have happened to it? Some of it would have been distributed to individuals. Yes, some of it would have would have stayed would have gone into the into the band trust account. That's correct. Yes. Well, could could the band not have taken it and invested it in Templeton funds? In 1987, it could have. That's not the band trust account. No, but but they could have taken it out of the band trust account, and put it into the Templeton Growth Fund. But it didn't have to go into the band trust account at all. Why do you assume it had to go into the band? Where trust would it go? Well, the band might have its own bank account. Could have gone into the band's bank account. Thank you. Yes, I think. Now might be a good time to break for the day. Thank you for your time and we'll pick it up tomorrow morning. Okay. Um, I'm just gonna remind you, sir, but you seem to be very familiar with this. Sorry? I'm just going to remind you, but you seem to be very familiar with it. You're not to uh, discuss your evidence with anyone during this period of time overnight. I'm aware of that, Your Honor. Um, Thank you. I, if, if it's okay, I will take a lift back with the, um, if that's okay, with the, the justice, but I won't talk to them about anything except the weather. You make sure of that. Yeah. All right. Um, you can talk about recipes or dinner suggestions. You've too. got some good ones, I will. Okay. <laughs> Thank okay. you. Um, so we're breaking until tomorrow, and how can... Uh, um, we can go off record now. Thank you. And how do you see your um, 